Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Inspire the Podcast with myself, Nicola Wills. Argus today is a self-made multimillionaire, having built a team of over 90,000 distributors in record-breaking time and tens of millions in sales in her network marketing business. She's the creator of the Pro Planner, making over seven figures. She also has a six-figure Airbnb business and is a property investor. With all this experience, she has created Entrepreneurcity, an online learning platform that teaches you from scratch how to build multiple income streams. This lady is next level fabulous. Please welcome Emma Cooper. (laughs) Hi, gorgeous. Oh my gosh. What, like the things that you have achieved already and what I just love, it's from scratch. And so, you know, people might hear that and go, wow, that's so amazing for her. But I know there is a lot of story, a lot of graft behind, you know, what you have created. So take us back to the beginning where did it all begin old now so that's way back (laughs) um well i was born in wales in south wales in a a little place called newport and i'm one of three children so myself uh, i'm the middle child and then my eldest sister nicola and my younger brother kyle and my mum and dad were very humble beginnings so they really had nothing dad was a milkman and mum was at home with the kids um, until dad started his business. Um, so he went and trained as a shop fitter, like carpenter. And then one day there's a big turning point. He set up his own business and our lives really, really changed. Or well, had that example, I guess, as a kid. Um, and I saw dad work really, really hard. So it was a great example of work ethic and kind of what you had to do to succeed. And so childhood was amazing. Like really, truly amazing. If I could go back and do it again, I 100% would. So, so nice. And what was it like at school? How were you at school? Um, I I think I was like naturally like bright and inquisitive, but school just really bored me. So I scraped through school with six GCSEs. I later have realized, you know, I've got ADHD and it all makes sense now, the, the stuff that was going on at school. And just if something didn't interest me, I just was not, I'm just like, it just doesn't interest me. And so... Um, Struggles a bit at school, but um, and I wasn't very confident at all. And um, I was all right within my peers, and I was really fun and bubbly personality. But then uh, with school, yeah, I just I didn't do that great academically. Yeah, and you know, definitely back then, if you didn't do great academically, then you're almost like written off. You know, aren't you? Like, oh well, she's not very clever. She's gonna be, you know, in childcare or. Go to, you know, she might, she can't even be a nurse because she can't go to university. You know, so you, there was just like, I, I remember that time and it's not, not much hope. And so what then happened to you? So did you say that you were, you know, you weren't very confident. Obviously, you're so confident now to be able to create that. Take us on that journey. <laughs> not that confident now. But <laughs> um, I remember being sat in the careers office. Do you remember back then they used to have like a massive catalogue and it was just jobs, like names of jobs. And yeah, I'd sit in there for hours in the, le- you know, in the lunch periods in a week. And I remember ticking loads of things like I'd like to be an air stewardess, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that, I'd like to do the other. And then I remember the teacher saying, you can only pick one Emma. I remember thinking like, how boring is life going to be if I just had to pick one and stick to it? So I guess that was probably like ADV stuff, but, but also like... I really love adventure. I love last minute spontaneity. So uh, when I left school, I looked by eight, but um, I did go to college. I say I went to college. I only ever got to the car park. So I chose A levels that my friend chose. I wasn't interested in history, film studies or English, but I took them because she did. And I was too embarrassed to go into a class on my own. So um, I failed all those. I got like three E's or something, which I thought was good because I never went um, and then I got jobs in call centres and I, I struggled to get a job. I think I did over 60 interviews. Um, wow. Yeah, I just, I was so, I was really naive as well. Like I wasn't, you know, what I never went to like discos. I didn't do the drinking thing, you know, which all my friends did with the 2020 and all that stuff. I just didn't do all of that stuff. So I was a bit naive, a bit young, definitely for my years. And so then getting a job just felt like, even though I'd had jobs before, like waitressing and stuff, I just felt just really nervous about going into this like big world and that I had to make this decision about what I want to do. And I had no idea 
like no clue. So you had no idea what you wanted to do and no confidence. So were your parents like, oh, come, you know, like trying to look after you, trying to help you? What was it my like? Dad, no. My no. dad, no, he was just like, just go to job, just go to job. Um, but my mum was the most positive, encouraged. I mean, she's on the point of being ridiculous. She was like, you could be anything you want. You didn't say you liked something to my man. Like my brother said he enjoyed singing. She booked him lessons with like the pop idol judges. Oh. Like my sister said that she wanted a wedding planner. And so she got my sister's wedding on UK Living, which was like the, the, the channel at the time. And she got these free wedding planners. They filmed the whole thing and followed around and did all that. So I, I never used to say anything to my mum because if I said something, she would make it happen. And I just didn't have the confidence. So um, mum was really encouraging. She's like, you could be a model. I'm like, mum, I've got a seven finger forehead and a really big ass. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, I don't even have pretty fingers or toes. Like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but she was just an encouraging, you know. It's like, well, where there's a will, there's a way. You can do whatever you want. Um, and so they were frustrated, I think, with my lack of confidence because my sister was really confident. She didn't have any issues like that. My brother was really great at school. So I was just like the middle one. Yeah. So and where like, do you think that lack of confidence came from? I actually have no, we talk about this, same upbringing, same environment, same encouragement. I don't actually know. The only thing I could think is that my sister, I put her on such a pedestal okay. that, I mean, she did, she was ridiculous. Like she looked like an American teenager, you know, and she just, she was beautiful and she was confident. She was effortless. Whereas I felt awkward. I had like a perm, a brace covered in freckles. I was really unconfident about those. So I don't know because I used to do dancing and I was like the number one, you know, champ, but all this stuff. So I don't, I honestly don't know where it came from. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's just so strange, isn't it? Because it's a little bit like myself and my sister, like I'm the eldest and super, super confident and ah. she's the youngest and exactly, you know, like she she's wonder. much better now. But, you know, growing up, especially through her teens and twenties, it was like, how she saw herself in yeah. compared to how we saw her. You know, like you said, like, oh, no, I've got all these freckles. Like, freckles are beautiful. Freckles are amazing. But when you have that thought that freckles are ugly, freckles mean I'm not yeah. good and not worthy, it's just crazy what you then attach to it because that's your skin and you're not happy with that skin that you're in. I know. It had a, had a massive effect, like my life I think like I got um, skin cancer when I was uh, it was non-malignant but I think I was I must have been young must have been like 15 the first wow. one yeah and then the second one they said oh well, the chances of getting it again were like one in a million or something and I had another one two years later um, and it was my mum had a sunbed at home that you put over the bed you remember years ago I used to rent them <laughs> and she came into the shop and I put it on for 60 seconds and the first like skin thing was here so I thought, oh, I'll just keep my neck out of it and it'll be okay. And then the second one came up within days here. And I never told my mum until I like got into my 30s. I was like, guess what, mum, remember that second one? <laughs> um, so I could never go on a sunbed, you know, a fake tan. If you haven't got any melanin in your skin, it doesn't work the same. And so I just used to wear foundation all over me. So uncomfortable. Oh, so I, just, I was like, I can't sit down. <laughs> I can't break my sofas. Um, and yeah, I've just... I was just uncomfortable. I just, I didn't feel good about myself, honestly, until probably, in all honesty, 30. Yeah. Yeah. But I understand. I, I get that. I, I feel I was exactly the same, probably until really. And now I look back at pictures after you've had the babies and you think, oh my God, I was insane. I but I just didn't <laughs> yeah. appreciate it at all. And I remember you know, looking at a picture of myself in an, an outfit. And I remember the feeling that I felt when I was looking at that time, I was like, oh my God, look at my, look at my legs, look at my bum, oh my God, my face, this, this. And then I look at it now and I'm like, oh my God, you were the hottest thing that I've ever seen. I say, I like exactly that, Nick. I literally say like, I look at pictures now and I'm like, I'm so hot, like I want to lick myself. I was beautiful, <laughs> what was wrong with me? If you could just go back and tell yourself like, I know. Heal out. Nothing matters, you yeah. know. Yeah. This is thing's gonna work out just fine. And do you think so what was it what was the catalyst for change for you? 
you know, during that time? So when I, I, I had loads of jobs in call centers, okay. didn't earn much money um, at all. Like I remember getting promoted to 12 grand a year um, in the woods. Hang on. I know. And wow. I ran into my mum and dad's house. Um, I was living with them still. And I ran in there and I was like, you are never going to guess what. Like I'm on to double figures. I should start paying you like much more rent. And my mum was like, oh, it's fucking, you know, like, it's okay. <laughs> Bless her. Um, and then the catalyst for change, my sister and I started a beauty salon, which was my first Girl. kind of taste of vanilla shit. Amazing. Went to America, saw that they had these walk-in nail salons. We didn't have them in the UK. Set up one in our local village and it went amazingly well. And I burnt myself out. So I learned about burnout like quite oh, wow. young too. Uh, I just could not, come to the HHT, just super focused, just work, work, work and couldn't stop. And then eventually, like, I had this big panic attack and I realized, like, okay, I just need to do something normal. So I oh, wow. joined the police control room then in, like, a call center role just for, like, non-emergency calls. And so that's throughout, that's your journey in your 20s where you're still feeling like you don't really know who you are. You're feeling uncomfortable in your skin. I love that you set up a beauty center with your sister. That's literally, like, the teenage girl's dream, isn't it? I like, know, don't... Don't, all we did was argue. Oh, really? Yes. I used to book her in all the really furry people because I didn't like waxing. And she would come out with like wax all over her gloves saying like, you've done it again, haven't you? You knew this. I'd be like, sorry. <laughs> so we always used to argue. And then she had young children at the time. I could oh, not have okay. understood how hard that was. Yeah. And I'd be like, we're never here. I'm always here, you know. So it wasn't like dreamy, like, oh, we just had the most amazing time. You know, I'd like to say that, but it was very real. Like, so I went off working in the police call center. I've had probably like 20, maybe 22 then. Mm. Of course, it's still, still so young. So just quickly, just go back to that panic attack. So are you someone that suffers with anxiety or anything like I that? I wasn't. No. <laughs> I mean, that was the first taste of it. And, okay. and since then in my life, I've, I've experienced like depression. Okay. Um, once that like very bad. And um, I think everyone, everyone has anxiety, especially the pace of life nowadays. It's so bad for us. You know, everyone's trying to just run constantly. And I think that, you know, everyone loves it. But back then I'd never heard of panic attack. So I woke yeah. up, literally just opened my eyes and I couldn't breathe. <gasps> Completely had like amazing night's sleep, like just went to bed as normal and uh, woke up just, I just lost it. And my dad ran into my bedroom and to me at like scoop me out of bed like a baby and he was just like what's the matter what's the matter like we can fix it just tell us what you've done tell us what you've done and um I just couldn't even talk and I just remember like the the pins and needles going up my arm and literally thinking like I'm gonna die like I can't breathe um and then even when I sat down to chat with them they were like what's the matter and I was like I don't know Honestly, like, I'm wow. fine. I don't know what's the matter. Yeah. And then I think they had conversations about, like, she's working too hard. We just lost my Uncle Clive, which is the first person close okay. to us and died. And I think, and I'd broken up with a boyfriend, like, my first boyfriend long okay, term. yeah, yeah. And so I think it was just all a bit too much, you know? Yeah. Oh, my God, bless you. And, and so that, then did you get, did, so then you like, they literally figured it out or did you have to go to hospital to oh, get Oh, I didn't do anything. I just, like... Carry on. So I got someone in to run the beauty salon and okay. we sold it. We made really okay. good money, so it was successful. But then I needed to get a job. Okay. So to do something. So I um, got a, a job in the police call centre doing non-emergency calls. And then I met my best friend Kay there. She was, uh, she's like 10 years something older than me. She'll kill me. Uh, but <laughs> she's like a, a mentor to me. Okay. And she really took me under a wing and helped me through an interview process because like I was really rubbish and then I got a job in the control room so then I did 999 calls and directing police officers to calls which is where I started thinking like maybe I'm, maybe I want to be a police officer oh. yeah I mean I watch those tv shows you know 999 what's your emergency I mean the thrill I know I mean as, as awful as it is <laughs> But yeah, you know, so, someone's in in the room. Like, it, obviously, I, I only watch movies on it. I've never been there. But I can understand why that would be a really fun and exciting place to work. Um, I and so then you saw, oh, actually, when a police officer, that's quite, yeah. like, that looks quite exciting. 
Yeah. Honestly, something happened actually terrible to someone very close to me and how they were dealt with as a woman by the police when it was not their fault and it was horrific. I remember um, being in like this Cardiff police station and she was treated so horrifically that I came home and I said to my mum, like, I'm going to become a police officer because I will never, ever, ever make someone feel like that lady made her feel. And she was like, well, I did tell you you should join the police. And I'm like, yeah, I was too embarrassed to join my local police force. I was too embarrassed because I watched them do all the training. It was like, get back with batters. I thought, there's no way I'm doing that in front of people I know. (laughs) So I applied for Manchester, which is like four hours away. I didn't actually know how far away it was. I'd never left my parents with such a close family. And I thought, and my mum took me to the interview when we were driving and and driving. I'm like, it was before sat you know. And I'm like, how far away is this mum? Like, this is going to cost me a fortune in petrol. Like, it's a bit far away, isn't it? She was like, well, it's too bloody night now, love. Like, you've, you've made your bed. You're going to get this interview, yeah. so you better, you know, get used to it. And that's how I ended up in Manchester. But and so I was, was too that- to go Bless to London. you. Bless oh, you. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're scared, you know, living in your village, then it, London is super <laughs> scary. <laughs> I do. And then so, so then is that the first time you moved out of your home? Into, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I moved, like, away from home. Okay. So then you're a police officer. Well, from I Amazing. Amazing. Very exciting. Not very well paid and can also be extremely dangerous. So talk to me through that. What was that like? Um, well, I got paid £1,600 a month as a police officer. Um, I think they get a little bit more now, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. It, does, it didn't warrant for me the, the danger, but I didn't care in the beginning. I loved it. It taught me amazing lessons about people and humans and yeah. how people behave. And also that one of the biggest lessons that I've ever learned is you can't reason with unreasonable. And one of the things, the reasons why I thought that I was going to be a really good police officer is I thought, well, I'm really diplomatic. I'm very understanding. I'm empathetic. Like I can make them see sense. But you very quickly realize when you're at domestic and a guy's ripped out a lady's hair and it's, you know, looks like he's pulled out her extensions and it's a real hair. And you say to him, you can't, and I literally, I remember this one job. I was like, you can't do that, mate. Like, that's horrific. And he said, the the thing is, so she always burns pizzas. And I just remember thinking like, you cannot reason with unreason. There is nothing... So when we worry about what will people think of us? Why don't they like me? Why, you know, you you just, you can't reason with unreasonable. Sometimes you'll walk into a job and honestly, they'll be like, you F off. And I'd be like, what? I'm the nice one. He's the idiot. You know, my partner or something. I'm like, I'm the nice one. But you, sometimes just people instantly don't like you. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. And it's best to just not focus on it. So it did really teach me some amazing lessons. But there were two female officers that were shot and killed on duty. Oh, um, wow. Fiona and Nicola. And they would just go into a normal routine burglary call. And the guy was wanted and he just shot them, executed them. Well, and I remember being in the police station And everyone's saying, like, have you heard on the other channel? And I'm like, no. And it was the next division to me. So it was the area that I lived in, um, well, near there, um, on that division. So I turned the channel and listened, and it was saying that, you know, they'd been shot and they were sending, um, but they confirmed dead. And then I went up to the canteen and everyone was watching it on Sky News. And I didn't even think to ring my parents or anything and let them know I was okay. I didn't have a clue. And on the TV, it was saying, like, there's two police women that have been shot and killed and the area. And so when I looked at my phone, like, my mum was ringing, my nan was ringing, like, everyone was ringing. I'm like, hi, I'm fine. And like, oh, my God, you don't even understand, you know. But I thought to myself, like, this is, this is close to home. Like, yeah. And then I thought, as long as I don't have to go to the scene, like, I'll be fine. And then because I worked on a small unit where we got, had to go into like emergencies and stuff, they said, um, you have to go on the scene. So we went straight there and we were sat in what they call the inner cordon. So like the right where the tents were and um, you could see the, they thrown grenades. So the bullet, like the grenade holes in the windows. And I remember all through the night I had to sit there like in the pitch black. 
And then some lovely neighbours bought us a cup. And I remember just swinging my legs on the wall and looking at these sort of tents and just thinking, like, that could have been me or anyone. And 1,600 quid a month? Like, what's your thanks for it? So that was like the moment I thought, oh, I really need to do something else. But you just get on with life, right? You just yeah. keep doing the daily. And I didn't change anything. Uh, and it wasn't until I met my husband, who was in the police too. And it wasn't until I got married in 2013. I got, I found out I was pregnant the day after our wedding, um, which was a great Christ uh, Christmas present, a uh, great wedding present. And um, it was only when I was 30 weeks pregnant that I got to the point then and I thought, I like now I really, really yeah. have to something because I'm yeah. stuck. Yeah. So you actually, and this is crazy, but you were a police officer still on duty being pregnant. Yeah, but you so were happened? Really, so oh, they took okay. you off the front line. Off the beat uh, as such. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I worked in like the intelligence side of it then, like okay. camera raids and things like that. Okay. And so tell me when you, talk me through that moment where you were like, this can't be it. I literally remember it so clearly. And I, I've told the story many times because it was... It was so crystal clear on that moment. And then from that moment, everything changed was when um, I was 30 weeks pregnant. My husband was at work. He was on a late shift, so he didn't finish till like, I don't know, one in the morning or something. And I was scrubbing skirting boards in my bedroom. Definitely a pregnancy thing. I don't do it enough. <laughs> the thing about skirting boards, though. I remember just glancing over. Uh, we were living in a house that my parents owned and we paid them rent. And I had no money in the bank. Um, and we were always in the overdraft. And I remember just looking over at what would have become my son's nursery. And it had, you know, the wardrobe, the cart, the changing table, the secondhand car seat, because I couldn't afford a brand new one in the in the crib. And I remember looking over and thinking like, oh my God, what have I done? Why did I think my life was so amazing? It was a moment where I felt like somebody had opened the curtains on my life and gone, why are you so happy? Like, it's really shit. I just thought my parents had given us such a great life and upbringing and in the position that I was in, there is no way in this world I could ever have done that for my children. So I just sat on the end of my bed and just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And then I had remembered that uh, someone I used to go dancing with years before had messaged me and said, do you want to win some extra money from home? Four years before that, mind. And I had ignored wow. every single message. And then I thought, I'm just going to message and say, like, can you please help me? Because I need to, I need to change. And then a few days later, I'd start my first online business. <laughs> and did you have any idea what you were getting yourself in, into? No. no. Uh, when the box of products turned up, I was like, why have they sent me these? <laughs> Honestly, it was like, I don't, I don't, I don't want those. Like, I can't even afford to buy those. So why, why would, why would you send me them, you know? But, you know, you either do it or you don't do it. And I was... It was my only option. It no, no other choice. Yeah. And I think, you know, when, you know, hearing, like at the beginning, I spoke about your, a little bit of your story, you, if you're going to do something, anything, and you're going to be successful at it, you have to give it everything. And you have to have such a big drive behind it to, you know, you, you totally and utterly transformed your life. Yeah. And to do that, it is blood, sweat and tears and stepping outside of your comfort zone like you've never, ever, ever experienced before. It's like, and it's, it's painful. It is painful. And especially with you, you know, not being that confident. So talk us through that. That So you were 30 weeks pregnant. You had your epiphany. I'm going to change your life. Four days later, you've got your box. Yeah. What did that then look like? So... I mean, I literally, I think it was my husband's say, I had to pay 20 pound off my credit card when I was on the phone to the girl. And she's like, I'm like, how much is it? I thought it was free. She's like, it's 200 pounds. I'm like, I got 200 quid. So I paid 20 quid off my credit card so that I could put the full 200 pounds on it. While she was on the phone, I was writing to Sean, like paid 20 quid off this quick. Um, and then, so it came and I thought, what the hell is this? And I remember Sean said to me, and he's so supportive, don't get me wrong. But back then, like 200 quid yeah. was 200 quid we really didn't have, literally. And I, he said to me, look, I, I believe you're going to do it, but all you've ever wanted to be is a mum. And I just think when the baby gets here, um, 
you know, you're not going to do it. All I ask is that you pay the £200 back. And I was like, okay. But in my head, I was like, how dare you? Yeah. I'm going to show you. And I did. And um, the confidence in me in that, I was not going to give up. I went into work like a couple of days later and I was like, guys, I'm not coming back after maternity to like 20 odd cops, you know, and they were like, what are you on about Burroughs, my surname then? And I'm like, I'm not coming back. I started this business. They were like, what are you doing? I'm like, send us to us. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay, so we'll see you in nine months, yeah? I'm like, no, I- I'm telling you, I'm not coming back. <laughs> anyway, then what I think about now, I'm like, thank God, like that I just made it work because I would have died. And then back then in that business, like you, you went to people's houses. I sat on living room floors. And then when I tell you, like, I did one a night, every, at least one a night, every single night for years. Yeah. For years. Sometimes no one would turn up. Sometimes it would be full. Sometimes, you know, but we we built it up. It started in my living room. I've got a picture of me heavily pregnant, up, sat on the floor with, like, 10 people squashed into my tiny little living room. And then the next week, there were 15. The next week, we went to a golf place. And the next week, we went to a hotel. And within... A few months, there was, I don't know how many people, like 200 people turning up to the hotel for these business presentations. And we, and no joke, we actually had to like have like bouncers off oh, my husband. Yeah. And he could stand a little and be like, nobody else can come in. Like they were already speaking. There'd be people sat in the aisles. Like it was, it was just crazy. But it was, it was because of the, you know, I did 17,000 miles on my new car in about four months. You know, I would drive. Now I look back at it, why should I just pay a driver? <laughs> so stupid. Like, I just sat in the back of work. Like, I yeah. don't know. I used to drive to Scotland and back in a day oh. um, with a baby in the car sometimes. <laughs> Helps for the day. But yeah, I just, I literally, and it was uncomfortable. I hated stuff like that. Yeah. And also you'd have to speak in front of people. How How did you manage to do that when you had... You know, that's, uh, that's honestly, a big deal. I just felt like I had no choice. Yeah. I just like, you either do it or you don't do it. Yeah. Like this, it was, it's that feeling where, and I, I completely resonate, is this is my ticket out of my current life. There was no other options. Not like there is today. There's so many options of making money online and being a so mom, a stay at home mom. It's different. But it was just like, this is it, you know, and... There was nothing. And how many years ago is this? 10. 10 years ago. Yeah, 2013, 10th of December 2013 is when I start, like, signed on the dotted line that I was starting my business, my first business, yeah. And so just t- tell us the accolades of that because it is just mind-blowing. Oh, I'm the money. Like, yeah. I'm, I know this sounds really stupid. You might think, me, how do you remember that from 10 years ago? But I remember, like, the first like two weeks of my business and then I got paid. I got paid £326, 1521 3016 4337 6457 11,090. And then it just kept going up and it was mental. Um, but I remember those first six months yeah. and I just could not believe this was my life. Now, most people will get to the oh, well, 3,000 is double my police wage and 6,000 is so much more and 11,000, that's crazy. But for me, I understood, like, just keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. Because for me, it's about security. So I built my business on the premise that I'm going to build it to 10 times what I need per month to live well, to live really well. And if anything happens, at least I know I'm safe and I'll have time to see it dropping so I can, you know, build up or whatever um, and so that's what I did I built it up I mean it went a lot bigger than 10 times what I needed but um, yeah that was the first one. Ugh. God it is so <laughs> exciting can I ask you a question we can yeah. you don't have does it what is the biggest paycheck that you've had in one month from your business that first business well that wouldn't be fair to say because we used okay. to get an annual bonus uh, okay we have the annual bonus I don't know it was something like 400 grand but if you put that like average across the year, like you know, a hundred thousand a month, yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, was done, yeah, and going from 1600 to that, we did and draft. absolutely amazing. And I think you know, along the way, and I'm sure you know, rebuilding my business is the same, a lot of personal development 
went yeah. on behind the scenes. Talk to me about that, Emma. It started with um, the secret um, and yeah. understanding like how to change. Uh, what I was, I, I used to always expect everything to go wrong. And if you think about it, if I hadn't have known that in the police, everybody in the police will tell you that like everyone's so negative because nobody rings the police to say, hey, this amazing thing has happened in our family. Will you come and check it out? It's always like someone's trying to kill me or this really bad thing has happened to me. Um, So it's a really negative place to be. But one thing that kept my head up was knowing like the power of your thoughts. So anytime I would get like, I can't do this or this is going to be terrible or this is going to end badly or this isn't going to go my way, I would switch it immediately. Now, I don't know physically what effect that had, but... I honestly believe that if you are, if you live in that kind of full process, you are open to seeing more opportunity. 100%. And if you see more opportunity and you're willing to take it, well, then things will change. You know, yeah. nothing just magically appears, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so then in your business, what kind of books and podcasts and, you know, things are you listening to in that the beginning few years of your online business journey. I used to know Jim, yeah, Jim Rowe. Used yep. to listen to him non-stop in my car. I really loved the compound effect, which Beat was it. a CD series. Yeah. Um, but it was powerful. You know, it was really powerful. And I'm like, this is it. And I remember I used to sit in my car holding my I had a Renault Clio and I used to sit and I used to squeeze the steering wheel and I used to imagine like it was a brain shelf. Um and I would squeal with excitement on my own, obviously with nobody else like around. And I used to have a mantra, which I realized that was a stupid mantra to have and it's dangerous, but I used to have the mantra like, I'm making so much money and I don't know what to do with it. Because the reality was I made so much money and I didn't know what to do with it. Instead, the mantra should be, I'm making so much money, I'm investing and it's 10x in all of the time. <laughs> that would have been more sensible at the time. But you live and you learn your lessons and, you know, yeah. your journey is your journey. So you'd learn some valuable lessons along the way. But, you know, learn that one. Change your mantra. If that's, if that's your mantra, change it. And so what are you saying that in the first few years you enjoyed spending your money? Well, I think I just spent it on stuff I didn't. I was very generous. So, I mean, I think money magnifies you. So if you are, if you're a nice person... You can be nicer because yeah. you have, you know, more of a means to do that. <laughs> can I swear? Yeah, fucking brilliant. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you were a dick, you just yeah. become a bigger dick. The so, biggest dick on the planet. Yeah. yeah. Probably money. with a small dick, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that. But money doesn't change you. It yeah. magnifies yeah. who you are. And so, yeah, I was like generous. I, you know. And I'm also one of those people, like, I've learned the skills to make money now. So I never feel fearful that it's going to go. I'm like, I've got the ability to always make money. I learned the skills I needed to know that I can start any business and be successful. So, uh, like, I'm not scared of money. I don't hang on to it tightly. But, of course, as I earned it, then I started to, like, invest it and, and do more sensible things with it. Yeah, absolutely. And did you have to kind of unlearn a few money mindset things that you had previously going on or did you always have quite a good mindset around money no it's terrible with money <laughs> and uh i think i don't know i think i always saw my parents be so generous like when we went for meals with other people they would pay when we uh we would take other children on holiday with us and they would pay and um, I remember the looks on other people's faces. So when my parents would pay for a meal, I saw like how happy it made yeah. other people and the fun that we were having and how just, I don't know, just our life. I saw like how that impacted others. And my mum, you know, when we were coming out of Tesco's, if there was someone sat there kind of like, you know, begging, uh, she would go back in and she would get, you know, a bag of shopping. And my son now, because of what he watches, if he sees someone, he's like, mum, can we go and get them some food? Like we were in New York and he was like, man, this guy hasn't got a home. Like, can we go and buy him a meal? I was like, yeah, of course we can. And then as we walked off, he like tucked my coat. It was only four. And he was like, man, I, I just want to give him my spending money. Oh, so I said, go on then. It was, a, it was only about like $40 or something. But he took all of his money out and gave it to him. I thought, that's good. But I really need to also teach him about like keeping it safe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 
I learned a lot of that. My dad calls us like Mother Teresa. He's like, you two, even if you won the lottery, <laughs> give it away. Um, but no, I've learned to be sensible as, you know, as a dog. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was brought up with the worst money mindset. So if anyone was wealthy in our village, it was like, oh, no, they're showing off. They're being flat. You know, they had these nice cars. They were like, oh, you know, just like just put, putting them down. Like they're not good people, you know, and I could, because of wealth. And it it took me, I remember, um, you know, the person that introduced me to the business saying to me, Nicola, you know, you can earn 10,000 pounds. And I was like, people like me don't earn 10,000 pounds. Like, you know, I could stretch to five, but I don't think 10, like that's a bit silly because it was just, you know, that I did, that was not the norm and and it felt uncomfortable and i remember when i uh, my first check paycheck of 1200 pounds i was bawling my eyes out because i was like this has changed my life i don't need any more <laughs> no and it's, it, it's crazy isn't it, it rich people in five grand a month like i thought like obscenely rich people like i didn't have any clue or concept of money i was like oh, five grand a month she will be able to spend it yeah you know yeah i know i know and how then that, you know, that changes and develops and, you know, and I remember even driving through, like when I lived in London, I'd drive through like Chelsea and I would feel like this feeling of, I don't belong here. Like that ick, because of the, it was like them and me and, and I wasn't equal to them. Anyone who had money was so much better than me. It's just, it's just bonkers. And now what I really realise, I mean, obviously not everybody, but a lot of people who are you know, very wealthy who have had success, you can't really be a complete bell end and build something up and be successful. You've got to be nice to people. You know, the majority. Oh, oh there are some bell <laughs> well, very successful. <laughs> but um, I think that like true success is happiness, right? And I don't think you can be truly, truly happy. Absolutely. Unless you're really coming with the right intentions and you really want to do good and you really want to make a difference and you really treat people well, you know? So, yeah, I think that that's real success, right, isn't it? A hundred percent. And so talk to me kind of what happens next within your your journey. Uh, so, yeah, that went wild. And my brother and my sister actually uh, did that business with me. So we were very fortunate because I was living in Manchester. My brother was in London. He was a police officer too. Yeah. And copied me and everything. And then uh, my sister was in Wales. She set up a doll company. It was called Bonnie and Pearl. And they were like the best-selling dolls in Harrods. So she did. Yeah, her doll company was amazing. Um, And so she started off really like the entrepreneur, like within the kids. Because my dad had a shop fit in business. Like we were never going to do that. And so Nick did a few things. She like used to do like high school musical parties she would uh, and then eventually she got to this doll company which was just incredible um and then she wanted to do some extra money outside of that because every penny goes back into that it was a massive brand and so she joined me um in my business and we all worked together so for Amazing. seven years yeah up until 2019 you know, we were able to travel the world. Nick and I built a really big business and, um, in the Middle East. So we traveled oh. and we had so much fun. Um, and then May 2000, and we, we moved to Lanzarote in September, we'll see, 2018. Mm-hmm. Because my son was just about to start, start school and I, I don't want to be trapped. So I'm thinking like... Oh. If I, if I put him in school now, I'm going to feel too guilty to take him out. So we'd gone on holiday to Lanzarote. We'd gone there as kids. So we went there and I just said to my husband, like, let's move quick. We have three weeks. So I was like, let's go. So we said, okay, let's go then. Let's just try it out for a year. And then we had been there for about 10 months. And um, mum and dad came to look after my son. We went on a trip to Sweden. And while I was there, I got a phone call to say that my um sister had been diagnosed with a very rare and really aggressive cancer um which it was obviously a shock and a surprise but in the february before that i'd had a terrible dream that she was going to be diagnosed with cancer so when i got the the text to like call me before you go to your conference i i knew exactly what it was going to be 
And how old was Nicola yeah. then? Yeah. She was 40 when she was diagnosed and then 42 when she died. And so just talk me through those two years that you had with her. Um, one minute. So from the... I don't know why, but from the second I had, like we're a really spiritual family anyway, yeah. like mum's a medium and we're all very like in tune, if you like, and we're so close. It's, it's almost weird. Like it's weird. I know it's weird. It's not normal as a family. Like it's strange. And my husband still laughs. He's like, it's so strange. <laughs> my mum still comes into our bedroom, you know, when we're in bed and she's like, I brought you a cup of tea and then sits on the end of the bed chatter. I'm like, that's so uh, so yeah, we're very close. And then, so when I got the call, I immediately like changed our flights. So they were a couple of hours uh, before and then uh, just flew straight home. And I never returned to Lanzarote. Sean went and packed us up. Okay. I still had my house in the UK. And so that was it. Like, I obviously wasn't going to leave it aside. Um, so uh, it was really hard at the first because um, Nick... Nick didn't want like any sort of like, she didn't want to be given a timeline. Okay. She didn't want to be told the exact name of the cancer because she was scared that she would go down the Googling. So okay. she said, Eng, will you, will you do the research for me? And, um, you know, you do it, but don't tell me. Like, I'm just going to focus on the positive. If I can pass that to you, I was like, 100%, of course. That was, that was really hard to do. Because obviously I realised very quickly and every step of like the sort of diagnosis and then they look at uh, the presence of this protein to see how like aggressive it is and every bit of news was like worse and worse and I thought, oh, come on, like there's got to be something and there just wasn't. It was just bad news after way there. It was just bad news after bad news after bad news and... It was difficult. And then Nick had a really big operation, which massively changed like the quality of the life. She had a stoma bag, but she had, it was a lot bigger than that. And she had like a lot of complications and she was, she was really poorly. Um, and so, uh, so 2020, obviously lockdown came. It didn't affect her treatment. At all. And actually, I'm really grateful for lockdown because it meant she came to live with me for a bit. And so I loved it. Um, but again, it was so hard seeing her struggle and um, just want to live so much. Like she was the one, you know, she'd never suffered like I had like with depression or stuff like that. And she was always so upbeat. She was always so positive. She was everybody's... She was everyone's encourager. Uh, so it was, it was just, it was just really hard to see her struggle so much. I, I explain it. And if anyone's been through like the cancer journey or any health journey with their family, as you well know, it's like, it's tormenting. It's the only, it's the only way I can explain it. Um, because it was 20 months of a journey that, and, and you're not just, you're almost like, you try and, um, what do you call it? Like you preempt grief. So you, you pretend you're like, okay, let's pretend she's not here today and see how I'll cope. And like, that's not possible because you've got to live every day. And then um, it was just really difficult. And seeing my mum and dad, like they spent every single day with her. And even when she was in hospital in London, they couldn't see her. None of us could. They stayed at like, I don't know how expensive like a property is to rent like an Airbnb. They stayed in a hotel which was next there so they could walk around on the pavement so she could just look down and wait. I know. So it was, it was really hard. She went to Germany for kind of like this um, special treatment. But when they got there, they didn't realise quite how ill she was. And then we were panicking. We were like, we need to get her home quick. Yeah. Um, so she came home the day before Christmas Eve and then she died on the 7th of January. And in that time, you know, life was still going on. 
um, but you just want to scream at everyone, like, stop, stop, please, can everyone help? Like, my sister's dying. So, no, hold on. So, yeah, oh, good, we look terrible there, hold on. But, so, yes, it's tormented, it's bloody hard, and it's, um, it's even harder afterwards, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because once, when they're alive, there's hope. Yeah. Isn't there? And I think that's the thing, is you just think, but what's this? And when you, you know, you, you have learned to have a positive mindset. Yeah. You can never not, you can't unlearn that. So you just no. think, I oh, know, but what about this? Or how about this? And, and this could happen. And, you know, why not? You know, I don't you. know because I, I'm a really like, I, I base everything on fact. I think okay. it's from being a police officer. So yeah. I'm very black and white. I am like, it is what it is. You know, there are some things that I was like, everything happens for a reason. Well, no, some things don't. No. But there are always, I believe, lessons to learn in those things that happen. There's certainly lessons to learn for me from, you know, losing Nick. And it is that life is too short to just keep going. Um, it's just too short to do things just because people expect you to do them or you feel responsible to do them. Like, do what makes you happy. There is no bigger price that you pay in life than regret. Yeah. And you have to make the changes while you can. You've got to do the things that you want to do while you can and while you're able. It's always the way, isn't it? Do you know, don't you find, like, if you ever, like, hurt your back or, I don't know, spray your mouth, you're like, I really want to go for a run. I know, I know, like, yeah. I've never run before that. <laughs> yeah. You just take for granted what is around you and what you have on an everyday basis, of course. Yes. And it's so it's that mindset, yeah. those lessons that you you learn. Um, so January the seventh, twenty twenty one, which is just over two years ago. Yeah, I bet it feels like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, and also like twenty years ago. Yeah, as it feels so long since you've seen them. Yeah, and did she have a family? Yes, a husband and two boys. How old are they? Uh, 24, 21 now. Okay. They were, they were, you know, obviously a couple of years younger, yeah. but it's very difficult. And you just and worship them. Yeah. And you just, and I, I feel like, you know, I, I have lost my brother, but he ha did, you know, he was severely, severely disabled. And we did know that we were always on borrowed time with him. But if I think about, can't even think about it, my sister, you know, like if I lost her tomorrow, I'd be like, I'd be so annoyed that I didn't do so many things with her, that we didn't, all these things that we promised. You know, I'm 40. And it, it was, was just like, like, you know, of, gosh, we're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see if anyone's listening to you. <laughs> you know, I feel the mad. Yeah. The, honestly, do them now and say this to my brother. I asked him to come to a Beyonce concert with me and he was like, we can do, we've got a lot of work to do and I'm this. And I'm like, Kyle, have we not learned, learned that lesson? lesson? Do it. Yeah. And to be honest with Nicolo, I don't have any regrets. Amazing. But in all honesty, yeah. we did so much. And we went to an amazing like pink concert before she had operation. So she was, you know, well. And, um, you know, we, we did the things. I mean, don't get me wrong. She could rattle you off a list like, of all the stuff she probably, st well, I know she would have still wanted to do, but she did so much in her life. Like, um, even when I, look, she had a boy's, like, well, she had a first one when she was 19. I look back now and you can only connect the dots looking backwards. You cannot connect the dots looking forwards. If you try, it's tormenting. Whether, I'm not talking about death and grief, but just in life in general, if you try and figure it out before you take the first step, you, you just won't bother because let me tell you, anything worth having, there will be curveballs and challenges and things that come up. If someone would have told me years ago, like, you're going to lose your sister when you're, you know, I don't know how many weeks pregnant I was, but when you're heavily pregnant and, you know, when you're, I don't know how old I was, either, like 38 or something, um, when you're that age, 
I mean, my whole life would have changed. I wouldn't have lived the life I did. I would have just settled back into like, well, oh my God, like we need to, you know. And so you can only know the next, like the next two, like the headlights, you know, you can only know the next 200 yards. You can have a vision of what you're working towards, but guaranteed as you get closer, it'll either open up and become so much bigger or you'll take a different direction. Probably completely something change. Happen. Yeah. yeah. You can't plan it all up front. Yeah. It's impossible. And I'm sure probably when she got pregnant at 19, it was like, oh, she's a bit young. 19. Oh, oh. I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. Because I didn't know anyone who was pregnant who wasn't married. So I was so embarrassed. And I remember one of one of her friend's brothers who was in my year telling everyone. And I was like, yeah, yeah. They, oh, it's terrible, really. But I remember my nan saying to my sister, which is surprising because, you know, they're kind of another era. She said to her, um, don't worry, Nick, you're not the first, you won't be the last. And so she was fine. And she was like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But exactly that, you know, like if she hadn't have got pregnant early, she wouldn't have had those amazing years, you know, being a mom with the boys, having, you know, such a huge impact on them because they were alive for such a long, big part of her life. Exactly. Exactly. You can only connect the dots yeah. looking backwards. Ugh. So, <laughs> Nick passes. Yes. And you're very heavily pregnant yeah i i gave birth to arch um 64 days after nick died so what after that i don't even know how long you're pregnant we get lied to nine yeah. months it's actually 10, 10. it's actually 10 <laughs> i know what is that i know uh, so yeah um that was i think it was the thing actually in all honesty that probably saved me and i feel like it happened that way on purpose i had many my eldest boy is nine and archie is now two and uh everyone's like are you crazy with that age difference i'm like i lost a lot of babies in between yeah. and um i feel like he came along at a time where i had to keep my emotions in check i couldn't like start drinking wine every night and crying yeah, which i really, yeah. really wanted to um you know i I had to still take care of myself because I had to put him first. Uh, yeah. So I couldn't quite put myself to the bottom of the pile at that point because he was, I had to look after him. So, you know, I was, I was conscious of that. And because of obviously all my losses, you know, he was just a rainbow child that was so wanted. And he, he didn't replace all of Nicola, obviously, but he really helped in just bringing some, some yeah. joy, like a lightness. To yes. the darkest of days. Yes. Yeah. Although he was horrific as a baby. <laughs> 18 was old. But was horrific. I literally couldn't leave the house. It was terrible. So apart from that, <laughs> he gave me time to just cocoon, yeah. to just, you know, like, let's just get through this. You know, I really wanted to enjoy him, but God, he was hard work. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh. Uh, and so your online business, your first online business is is there supporting you and your family through this time yeah um, and you have a bit of a, an epiphany don't you like around this you know like you wanted more that right? I was confused for a while okay. so after I started my first business I think it was like 18 months later I started my planner business my pro planner and that went crazy wild but that was just honestly was just a hobby I didn't start it making money to make money because I was all make, ready making amazing money. I didn't know that it was sensible to build multiple streams of income. Like, I just didn't know these things. So it was just like, I need a planner. Can't find anything for like really busy people. So I was just really miffed off in my office one night, one o'clock in the morning. I was like, screw all these like post-it notes. Like I'm creating my own planner and going past it to my husband. I was like, Come make this. And we did. And it went really, really well. And then... um then in uh hold on 2021 nick died yeah so that was oh come on hey i'm gonna think so yeah i my businesses were, were great but i just had this like i really need to change when i tried to go back to my you know my first business and do that it just magnified the fact that my sister wasn't here because we did it together and i just felt like why would i put myself through this every day this is just like it's horrifically hard so I decided that I was going to kind of retire mm -hmm. 
from that sort of business and um, just see when, see what I wanted to do. So I started a small like membership um, membership group where I was teaching people about, you know, how to build their businesses, how to market, how to sell better, that kind of thing, sold a few courses and then for um I started a business so I had a business partner to at first and then she went off and did something else so uh, I bought her out and now it's yeah entrepreneurity was okay. born and it's yeah it's ours and I really love it I mean entrepreneurity <laughs> please tell us all in detail what you know so let's say I'm gonna sign up for entrepreneurity what am I gonna get now, because I know, and it's absolutely amazing. I swear there is nothing on the planet no, like this right now. Like you are an absolute pioneer in creating this one-stop shop. And, yes. you know, we spoke about earlier, like the, you know, there are courses, there are different things and there are coaches and mentors, but, you know, half the time you can't find everything in one place. And no. second of all, it's so, you know, expensive that you either do one thing and then you miss out of the other or you know you've paid for a coach and they're not even the right coach anyway you yes. know so this is like for the average person who is looking to change their life and they're thinking right there's an online platform space here what can i do with it what would i want so talk me through it um yeah so remember when we were saying like there was nothing around back yeah. when we were looking nothing, yes. just something else and so I remember scrolling for hours and hours and hours on the internet looking, well, how could I? And it was like stuffing envelopes from home. And I tried <laughs> Swarovskiing Converse, I think they were fakes, shoes for children into like Disney and that didn't work. I tried a jewellery business, you know, I, I just tried everything. But there was nothing. You couldn't find anything online other than buying a franchise. And I have no money, so I couldn't do that. So what I wanted now was now it's the opposite. Now you go online and there's, you can do this, you can do that. And now you don't know what's not, a, what's a scam? What's not a scam? Can I really make money from that? And so I wanted like somewhere where you just got told like it is, you know, actually like it is like you could do this business. Here's the pros and cons. This is what it's like. This is what it's going to take. This is what the investment is or no investment. And that's what I wanted somewhere where you could go where you didn't have to spend, I don't know, five, 10 grand, 20 grand, 100 grand to take a course and you were going to be stuck to it, tied to it. You could dip in, dip out if you wanted to. But it was a community where you could, it was affordable and it was accessible. So inside of there, we basically had courses that on the outside are sold for anywhere for, from like three and a half grand up to 10, 15,000 pounds. This, you know, that's what the, the experts sell them for outside of our platform. But what I was looking for was to actually get the experts i'm not an expert in everything i can pretend to be what value is that for people you know i'm like so good at facebook ads but someone who's an expert in facebook ads is so much better than me i you know i've built a really great coaching business that somebody else has built even better one so i'd rather everyone be taught by the experts so yes inside there you can learn how to start an airbnb business how to start and build a network marketing business how to become a social media manager how to become a va how to fill in the bike there's everything in there um and yeah and how to sell on amazon that's really interesting to me how to build an amazon business how to build an etsy business um there's yeah that's there's there's loads of stuff in there so we have over a thousand students i think maybe over like 1600 1800 passed through the door since september um and the feedback is like crazy nobody expects and Neither would I. I wouldn't expect to go into something that's 39 quid a month, be wowed by value. I'd think mm, it's probably going to be okay, but it's insane. And that's what I love that it's like everywhere. It's like, oh my God, I did not expect this. And what also I would think is what well, if it's 39 pounds, then everything else in there I'm going to have to pay for. Like it'd be like ex entrance to the platform and they'd be like, this course, 50. This course, so it's completely 39 is what it is. No upsells, no contracts you can cancel any time, like nothing. That's what I didn't want. I don't want anyone tied to anything. I want people to just, you know, if you come in, you learn how to build a business on Amazon in a month, you pay 39 quid and you get lost. I'm happy. You can go away and say, I still can pay 39 quid. I built an Amazon business. This is the income I've got coming in. That's my impact done. That's my job 
then that's like purpose fulfilled. Like I'm good with that. If you want to hang around and you want to have access to me in like our mentoring sessions, I answer like personal questions then about, you know, how do I build this business or I'm coming across this challenge or I'm doing this. Well, that's great. But if you see no value in it, then don't stick around. Like why would you keep paying? So I'm, I'm cool with it. Like, you know, it's, that's what it's for. Oh God, this is amazing. You get me on it now. I look, because I always, and you know, and I would say I'm quite like, you know, good online and I know kind of what I'm doing, but I don't really, I, I don't really, because if I did, I know, I'd have to post a few free pictures on Instagram, but as far as like, you know, I definitely know I would love to maybe, you know, like social selling, but not within network marketing, but another side of that. But I haven't, yeah, I haven't started purely because I don't really know what I'm doing. And so therefore you'd stop. And this is why this, this course is just perfect. But it's literally step by step by step, isn't it? Yeah. The issue is as well. So you can get. I paid. I paid well over like a hundred grand. It's fully out. One hundred and twenty grand now. So just paying another twenty grand for a coach. So I have paid a lot of money in my time to learn. But the problem is, you go to one person to learn how to do one thing, one person to learn email marketing, one person to learn branding, one person to learn Facebook ads, another person to learn a sales funnel. And it gets flipping expensive. And you, with so much noise on the internet, who do you trust? I know, yeah. Who could do it? So I, I, what I say to people is, so when they come in, we also have a, like a load of experts in different areas. And I say, if you want to help with Facebook ads, this is the go-to person. It took me 10 years. I spent a fortune with people promising and never delivering. This is the girl I trust. You can use her. Because other people, they have their teams, right, behind the scenes building the business. They never share them with you. You know, you can't ask them, who do you use for this? Or this is a classic. Who printed your planner ever? Like that took me five years of errors, getting things wrong. I lost over a hundred grand. Like I lost a lot of money because that's business. You make, you know, you get things happen. You get challenges thrown your way. And when I overcame them, I was like, God, I really want to help other people so that when they wake up and they have got 10,000 planners that they can't sell, like I'm here to stop that happening. So I've hooked loads of people up with printers and, you know, trusted people that I can say, hands on heart, this is someone that you can trust a million percent. They'll do the job for you. So it's access to network, isn't it? Yeah. And do you know what I just love about the mo- love the most about this? The whole thing is that you have been there, done it yourself. So many people set up these like coaching platforms or you know come and learn how to do this and they hook you up with people but they have you know they've not done anything themselves you know they're just the facilitator but they've not got a pot to piss in they've not experienced (laughs) it you know they're not like you know I remember someone saying you know I can mentor you I'm like yeah but you don't have a life that I want you haven't got anything you know and but you have like what you are you've been done that and you've got an example of what you're teaching and that's just what I love that you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, but you're passing it on. And I think, you know, that is as far as like, it's almost like you're like a big mentor, you know, like a, an umbrella mentor, you know, passing, like, not only am I going to teach you I what I've done, it's <laughs> passing on the contacts and it's actually the contacts that are the most valuable, the network. They always say your network is your network, but it so oh, is. Yeah. New. If you've got the wrong network, it really affects that net worth because you can lose a lot of money paying for things that don't get done right. I, I, it's a, the, it's the power of, of that. Someone say, I, I am not embarrassed to say like I have messed up royally on many occasions, but I share it all inside of the curriculums, the courses yeah. inside. So I'm like, listen, I can tell you about this because this is what happened to me. Amazing. I lost money. I woke up one day and this happened. I got a unit and these were the outgoers and this is what it costs. Think about other ways that you could do it. But I'm also doing it with them. I'm still building my empire. Like I'm just starting an Amazon business. And, you know, I am doing it with the students. They're laughing. They're like, really? I'm like, yes. If I didn't think it was freaking insanely amazing, then I would not be showcasing it in front of you. I'm, I'm walking the wall like I'm doing it too. You know, I might mess up, but it's okay. I'll tell you. Yeah. Oh my God. I love it. Yes. I'm going to be joining. I'm, I'm signed up. I'm this. Get me in. I am there. I read. There's so much that I want to learn. And, and 
and for not knowing how to, I haven't done it. So I'm grateful for this conversation. Everyone, you can come and teach everyone how to start a podcast, please. Because oh, yeah. Do you know it. what? That it is, it, again, it has been a learning, learning curve. It actually, you know, starting this podcast up, it really takes me back to the beginning of starting my online business. And I remember thinking, I'll never work that hard ever again. Well, actually, now I'm a mum of two and I've still got my online business going and I'm doing this. I'm working just as hard, yes. but I don't have anyone to ask. You know, So I have had people that you know I've paid to do things and I'm, they've come back to me and I'm like, is this it? This is terrible. And to me first. I know, I know. I need it. I need it so much. Until you know, you don't know. No, you until, really don't. Until you find out. Like, how can you know? People say, like, oh, I'm sorry for asking this. Like, I'm sure I should know. How would you know? You've done it. You don't know. So there's never silly questions or, you know, I always ask first. Yeah, same. And I think that's just not being back, not being afraid to. And just like, no, like, there is not a question on this planet that is silly or you know that you shouldn't and ask Rafik, should i start a business and the answer is always always yes yeah multiple streams of income that's where we need to all be yeah and in just a few sentences sum up to us what why is multiple streams of income so important i mean if we don't know now for the whole cost of living thing uh, yeah then in any industry, I believe that uh, anything can change. And you know when anything is based on volume of anything, which everything is, right? Everything is sales. Unless you were selling something, you wouldn't really have a business, even if you're doing it directly or indirectly. And so you have to even it out. You have to secure your foundations. Think about a stool. If it's got one leg, it's very unstable. If it has two legs, slightly more stable, but it's still rocky. Three legs, you're getting there. Four legs, amazing. Five legs. I mean, you're stable. The average millionaire was seven streams of income, right? And so, and I get it. Like, I think I, I'm maybe at five, actually. So I'm not an aspitch. But um, you, you, once you build it up there, you're like, I get it now. I see. I understand. So it's for me about the security. When one industry drops, another one will boom. You know, and it was like lockdown. I have an Airbnb business. Nobody can book a property. If I had only relied on an Airbnb business... I'd have had sod all. So I had all, you know, the other businesses were growing. Everyone bought planners. Everyone wanted health and beauty products. Everyone wanted an extra stream of income business opportunity. So it balances itself out. So I feel like, you know, like sound bars. Yeah, yeah. We need to just like, just build the stream so that if something happens to one, you are evened out by the other. It just makes you so secure. Yeah. And that feeling that, whatever happens you're gonna be okay like and i think yeah. especially i don't know as a woman like i want to feel that you know and i don't want to feel that from my husband or my family uh, but just from for me personally knowing that i've got my back oh god it gives you peace i think it's so i used to think it was like an amount of money to think like, oh, you know, when... It was only when I hear my friend Michelle say this that I really realised, like, yes, that's exactly what I thought because I I used to have it like, okay, if I've got 100,000 in the bank, that's a good, like, yeah, bucket. If I've got a million in the bank, that's a good bucket. It's stupid to have a million pounds in the bank. But um, that's where I used to go, you know? And, and the target always just moved higher and higher okay. and higher and higher. And so I never got to the place. I thought if I had half a million in the bank, I'd feel safe. Didn't feel safe. It was only when I acquired the skills that I need to build any business, then I felt safe because I've got the knowledge. I can make money doing whatever I put my mind to because it's the same set of skills that you need. So if you can build one stream of income, you can build multiple streams of income. And so that's when I felt safe and I had done enough learning that I knew whatever I put my mind to, whatever I, you know, touch, it will be, it will be okay. Ugh, just so powerful Thank love you. it oh, and Emma before I go on to my final question I would love to know what is your vision for the future for yourself and your family what do you want to okay I would love to give you some really like deep answer but when grief 
hits you, as you very well will know, it changes everything. Everything with my vision before included my sister in it. We always did things as like siblings. And so I really struggled with this. And yet I am the biggest advocate of, you know, visions and goals and all of that stuff. But, you know, for me, my vision is to, and this is like, I'll probably change this. I know I have a really big vision in terms of what like my, um, like the structure of the business looks like with the different streams within that. But more than that, my is to be happy on the daily. So to get up every day and think, if this was my last day, would I do what I'm about to do? Aside from if it was my last couple of days, obviously with my family. But if if I'm going to get up today and do, do I enjoy it? Do I love it? Do I have a passion for it? Does it light me up? Yes, absolutely it does. So I know I'm exactly where I'm meant to be because that's how I feel every day. Nothing's a struggle. I absolutely love it with every single part of me. And so that's the vision to keep that, to keep, to keep that, that feeling, feeling yeah. every day, to love what I'm doing. Yeah. And it is a feeling. You know, it's a it fe- is a feeling. It's that how do I feel today? Is this grateful stuff. all the time? I know. Same. Not because of, you know, the view when I look out the window, not because of a beautiful home or it, I'm just so grateful that I'm here and I get to do what I love. You're never going to get to doing what you love, though, until, you know, people are like, I don't know what they're talking about, purpose. I didn't have purpose for years. So to get to, like, you know, 40 times, it's purpose. But outside of being a male or wife, but um, you, you have to keep coming because it, it keep going it, because it will, it will come. Will come. Yeah. You will find it. But you've got to keep taking the steps. Don't wait for it to appear. Yeah, I love that. And my final question to every single guest that we have on the podcast is, what advice would you give to your younger self? Don't worry. Don't worry. Stop trying to forward plan everything. Stop trying to work everything out. Just, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. You can't connect them looking forwards. It's just tormenting. So enjoy every day as much as you can. Look for the opportunities. Live with an open heart and an open mind. And keep keep going. Keep moving forward. No matter what happens, you have to continue to take the steps. So can t- take the steps. Surround yourself with people who are go-getters who, you know, and don't, I, I, I when people go, oh, my family are negative though. Like, oh, so so fine. Like, so what? I find people who, you know, who, who have the belief, who have the vision, who are moving forward, who are relentless in their pursuit of success, happiness, yeah. call it whatever you want. Um, and hang around those people as close as you can. Yeah. And there has never been an easier opportunity than, you know, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. These exactly. people, the people who are the movers and the shakers and the happiness spreaders, they want to spread that joy and they want to share with you, you know, learn about the law of attraction, learn about mindset, learn about breath work, learn about, you know, everything is all there, um, you know, at the click of a button. And so... It's a lot of the reason why a lot of people join entrepreneurship because they just, they want to be around other entrepreneurs who are doing the do. You know, it's hard to tell when you're looking on social platforms, like, are they for real? Are they for yeah, real? Yeah. Are they for real? They know in there, like, you're getting it for real. Yeah. Like, there's no positive toxicity. You've got an issue in your business. You've got to say it. And then you'll get a load of advice from a lot of entrepreneurs that have been there, done it and worn the t-shirt. Oh, God. I just love it. I've literally just, I've had a vision come into my mind. I just really want to share this with you. That it is a massive, because obviously your courses are all online, right? And so, but there will come a point where it will be a annual conference, an in-person meetup of all of your online students where they meet together. I just saw it, literally that vision came in as you said that. That's weird, Nicola, you should keep your eyes peeled because we already have the plans in place. And maybe we'll ask you to come and speak. Oh my God, my darling, I'm there. I am there. I swear, I literally, I'm a Pisces and That's I just weird. feel it. I just feel That's so my weird. intuition. I'm um, like, Shh, it's a secret. <laughs> yeah, I promise you, no one you haven't said anything. I just, I just feel no. it. As you said it, like this, this vision. Um, but my darling, it has been the biggest pleasure. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your story so openly and so, so much vulnerability. I think, you know, you hear 
how fabulous you are. But behind that, I know there's a lot of blood, sweat, tears, heartache, ups, downs, griefs, you know, and, and you're still here putting one foot in front of the next and it's making keep- a huge impact. Exactly. So thank you so, so much. And um, if you do want to get in contact uh, with Emma or join her course, everything is going to be in the show notes below. Um, And I know that you're going to have a huge impact on so many people's lives. This is just the beginning. Thank you.